I want to show you how important it is for all of us to protect the most sensitive and beautiful parts of our planet. From Greenland to Antarctica, from coral reefs to rainforests, even if we believe they have nothing to do with our jobs, our businesses and our daily lives. I also want to learn, together with you, the solutions to the climate crisis that are available to all of us in different countries and regions. My name is Pancho Campo, and my personal crusade is to show you, through the Planet Future documentaries, the impacts that climate change is having around the world. Because we cannot wait any longer. The time to act is now. Iceland is a volcanic island, which originated only about 16 million years ago and is thus one of Europe's youngest regions. The Iceland's landscape really is unique. Although Iceland is just below the Arctic Circle, the winters on the island can be warmer than many northern capitals thanks to the Gulf Stream. The landscape is a blend of rough volcanic soil, impressive glaciers and breathtaking waterfalls. It can be romantic with its cliffs, deep canyons, black sand beaches, boiling geysers, magnificent fjords, majestic volcanoes, and of course, the northern lights. But this incredible landscape is not the main reason that brought me to record one of our Planet Future documentaries. Iceland is regarded as the most sustainable country on Earth and the land of renewables, especially geothermal energy. The story of Iceland's transition to green energy should inspire other countries seeking to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. Today, almost 100% of the electricity consumed in this small country of only 330,000 inhabitants comes from renewable energy. In addition, 9 out of every 10 houses are heated directly with geothermal energy. The mixture of geology, and northernly locations gives the country extensive access to renewable energy. The island lies on the mid-Atlantic ridge between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates, a very active volcanic zone that is the origin of its geothermal systems. Glaciers cover 11% of the country and its seasonal melting feeds glacier rivers, contributing to Iceland's hydropower resources. The country also has tremendous wind power potential, which remains unexploited. Iceland's economy is primarily powered by green energy from hydro and geothermal energy, with fossil fuels used almost exclusively for transport. However, the number of electric vehicles is growing exponentially. It is widely used to heat swimming pools and spas, power fish farming and produce cosmetics greenhouse cultivation and food processing. Perhaps the only inconvenience of geothermal energy is the smell of sulfur the water has when washing your hands or taking a shower. One of the goals of our Planet Future documentaries is to study the impacts that the climate crisis is having in the countries and regions that we visit. We traveled to Iceland three times and our last trip was in November 2022, which was very warm all over the country. The average temperature was the highest recorded in that month nationwide, 
It was about three degrees warmer than average. Welcome to Iceland, the land of fire and ice. No one else can define a more diverse, contrasted and extraordinary nature. Iceland has so many spectacular landscapes, volcanoes, waterfalls, glaciers that has been featured in numerous Hollywood movies. For example, a favorite of mine, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, played by Ben Stiller. But the most famous of all is Game of Thrones. And today I bring you Kirkefell or Church Mountain. This is a one million year old volcano that it was portrayed in the extremely successful series of Game of Thrones. With such diverse and exotic landscapes, Iceland is a stunning backdrop for many TV shows and films. Because of its vast and empty expanses, many directors and producers have chosen Iceland for filming. Interstellar was a widely acclaimed and Oscar-winning movie starring Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway and Matt Damon, amongst many other stars. There were two prominent filming locations for this movie, including Svinafell's Jokut Glacier and Mafabot. Each of these represented a different planet within the movie's plot. The Icelandic scenery was also a central focus in much of the promotional material for the film. In The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, starring Ben Stiller, the landscapes play a significant role. The movie script happens in the USA, Greenland, Iceland and the Himalayas. However, it was only filmed in the United States and Iceland. The scenes from other countries were all done in Iceland. The James Bond series has featured more than one movie with amazing scenes shot in Iceland. Some of the first James Bond movies starring Roger Moore included Iceland in their epic battles. The scenes from the 1985 production A View to a Kill included frozen glacier lagoons and fight scenes amongst giant blue icebergs. Another movie of the 007 sagas, Die Another Day, starring Pierce Brosnan as the new James Bond of the time, was filmed in the town of Hofen and Europe's largest glacier of Vadna Jokut. The TV series Game of Thrones is perhaps what Iceland is best known for hosting in recent years. There are many episodes and scenes in this movie shot throughout Iceland. Green by Iceland is an organization part of the structure of Promote Iceland. It's a platform for cooperation on climate issues and green solutions. The role of Green by Iceland is to fight climate change locally and globally and to promote the export of Icelandic green solutions while supporting Iceland's reputation as a leader in sustainability. Iceland has been harvesting renewable energy for more than a century and it is now aiming for carbon neutrality by 2040. As we mentioned before, 100% of electricity and house heating needs are met with renewable energy in Iceland. I met with Nort Thorsberg, the CEO for Green by Iceland, who explained to me the country's journey towards carbon neutrality by 2040. The government is committed to uh, reaching um, carbon neutrality as well as eliminating the fossil fuels. Um, amongst the first nations in the world to do so uh, in 2040 as well. This is a very uh, you know, ambitious journey, but uh, to uh, enable this, we have a, a clear uh, climate action plan. It has uh, a range of 50 actions, the many of which have already been uh, implemented, well, 34 of them, uh, and 17 that are still uh, being uh, worked or in progress. And they are covering all the different sectors and all the different actions that need to uh, take place to reduce the emissions uh, or capture uh, the, the carbon from the atmosphere to reach carbon neutrality. Of course, having a plan is not only uh, the, the, the thing, also working together is a really important aspect. And that is what we are emphasizing. We are really uh, bringing uh, the people together, so communication, 
uh, is key, uh, setting targets at uh, every single level because every single action counts. You know, even the small ones count and the big ones. And it's the commun communication of these that will ultimately get us to, to our goals. The Golden Circle is the most famous of all scenic routes in Iceland and combines stunning landmarks with historically significant places. Its proximity to Reykjavik and the short drive between those landmarks makes it very easy for everyone to include the Golden Circle Tour in their itinerary. The three most important features of the Golden Circle are the stunning Golfos waterfall, the geothermal area in Haukadalur with its great geyser, and the historical and geological treasure of Iceland, the National Park of Thingvellir, where the most famous fissure of Silfra is located. Gulfos, it's a massive waterfall with a tremendous surge of more than 100 cubic meters of water per second, and is one of Iceland's most visited landscapes. However, the future of Gulfos was once very much in question. In 1907, an Englishman by the name of Howell was leasing the land around Gulfos and was interested in setting up a hydroelectric plant. The landowner's daughter, Sigridur Thomas Dottir, led the fight to stop the project, gathering the funds to hire a lawyer to cancel Howell's contractual rights. Thanks to her efforts, which included the threat of throwing herself into the waterfall, the hydroelectric plant project was eventually abandoned. Today, Golfos waterfall continues to run free and Thomas Dottir is recognized as an Icelandic conservation hero. This is one of the reasons why we came to Iceland, geothermal energy. From the Greek, geos, earth, thermal, heat. And it's a renewable energy because the earth is constantly producing heat. That's why Icelandic people have this fantastic source of renewable energy and they're able to provide electricity and heat their homes at no cost. Geothermal energy. Geyser, sometimes called the Great Geyser, is the source of the English language word geyser. The name comes from the Icelandic verb geysa, meaning to gush. So, all the famous gushing eruptions around the world that we know as geysers have Iceland's great geyser to thank for their name. Geyser doesn't erupt too often these days because it's been active for more than 10,000 years and it is slowing down. Strokur, on the other hand, it's incredibly active, erupting every 5 to 10 minutes. In addition to the geysers, you will find over 40 hot springs fumaroles and mud pots. Fumaroles are steam-emitting openings in the earth crust, while mud pots are acidic, bubbling, muddy hot springs. Thingvellir National Park is the only UNESCO World Heritage Site on the Icelandic mainland. While the incredible landscapes often entice visitors, the location's cultural history is what earned Thingvellir its UNESCO designation. The world's oldest existing parliament first met here at Thingvellir. This open-air gathering occurred in 1930 AD and the site continued to be used as a meeting place until 1798. The national park is named for the parliamentary meetings as Thingvellir translates to parliamentary plains. Silfra is a fissure between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates in Thingvellir National Park. The rift was formed in 1789 by the earthquakes accompanying the divergent movement of the two tectonic plates. Silfra is at the top of any scuba diver's list of diving sites. It has become a must visit for scuba diving enthusiasts worldwide because it is the only place in the world where you can dive or snorkel directly in a crack between two tectonic plates. This fissure is filled with melted water from the Langjökull glacier 
filtered through underground lava for 30 to 100 years before reaching the spring that feeds into sulfur. Therefore, the water is exceptionally pure, allowing for underwater visibility of over 100 meters. Silfra is said to have the most transparent water in the world. The glacial melt water remains very cold in Silfra, but as fresh water constantly fills the fissure, the water never freezes and remains between 2 and 4 degrees year round. We partnered with Iceland leading diving center dive.is to scuba dive into the fissure. As you can see in the images, it was not an easy dive because we hit lousy weather, it was very windy and freezing cold. To be able to dive in Silfra, you must be a paddy advanced diver with a specialty in dry suits. Dive.is are specialists in conducting dry suit courses, but if you are not certified, you can always try snorkeling. Hosey, the general manager for Dive.is, helped us understand the impacts of climate change on the Icelandic marine environment. The ocean around Iceland is getting warmer and the acidity of the water is getting higher and this is happening faster than in other areas on the planet. And this may result and has resulted in a change of uh, species. Uh, what I understand is that uh, like the smaller species are disappearing um, leading to also disappearing of the uh, bird life because birds are eating the smallest fish of the chain and when the smallest fish disappear the birds also disappear. So and uh, aquaculture is also getting is fast growing in Iceland so it's a quite a big concern, I would think, that uh, the ocean is getting warmer. I think we do a lot. We do everything we can. Of course, you can always do better, but I believe we do everything we can to protect uh, Mother Earth. Um, regularly, we conduct dive site cleaning um, to our most uh, important dive sites, of course. Um, we do conduct beach cleanups together with an organization, uh, environmental organization called the Blue Army, which is also founded by the same guy as Dive.is, Thomas Knudson, a great legend in Iceland. And we are very proud of having him around us. Um, we also provide finance support to this organization to help in keep cleaning the beaches of Iceland, which believe, we believe is very important. Uh, in the past years, we have also been planting thousands of trees here in the neighborhood of Reykjavik. Uh, we are looking forward to see this forest grow one day. <laughs> you know, um, uh, Everything we do here, uh, all the trash is recycled. We try to inform our guests and students about environmental responsibility. Leave nothing behind but the bubbles and take only photos, you know. Um, of course, we are part of Vakin, environmental uh, uh, protection uh, uh, organization in Iceland for the tourism. Uh, we are part of Project Aware of Party. We pay to their organization. They are also supporting like cleaning of the oceans, the planet, and the list goes on. Um, our next step, our aim, is to have our car fleet uh, fully driven with uh, electric. So that's something we like to do in the next three or five years. So there's a lot of things that we can do as an organization to help out in this fight. Our diving guide was Giancarlo, a citizen of Peru who has been working in Iceland for several years. Once in the water, with your corresponding dry suit, it was a delightful sensation. Indeed, it is the most pristine water in the world. It was also quite an experience to be able to dive and touch with one hand the Eurasian and with the other the American tectonic plates. However, the question remains. If the melting of glaciers continues at this rate due to climate change, how long will we be able to enjoy diving in Silver? My next visit was to the Geothermal Park, a platform for companies interested in using clean and renewable resources for their vision. 
The owner of the park is On Power, a company that also owns and runs three geothermal power plants that produce hot water and electricity. On Power is an energy company in Iceland. We are mainly a geothermal energy company and we operate two geothermal power stations in the same area that produce both electricity and hot water. The electricity we produce for uh, our clients uh, around the whole island of Iceland and the hot water we are producing for the citizen of the Reykjavik area. We also operate one small hydropower plant in the west part of Iceland. The park has a wide range of operations that aim to utilize geothermal resources with the mindset of waste to value, benefiting the environment and creating value. It also features the geothermal exhibition, where visitors can learn firsthand how renewable energy is produced at one of the largest single-site geothermal power plants on the planet, Heli Shady Own Power Plant. We have around 100,000 visitors uh, to the exhibition every year. Around 90% are tourists. And here they can uh, get to know uh, uh, things in general about uh, geothermal energy and also about what we are doing here. And then around 10% are from Iceland. Families, school groups uh, come here a lot to, to see the exhibition. And we both want just the people know more about geothermal energy and enhance the interest of the younger generation uh, for the opportunities in, in the energy industry in Iceland. Within the geothermal park, a must visit is Carbfix, which has achieved world fame and reputation, especially since Hollywood star Zac Efron visited their facilities to record part of his documentaries. Trees and vegetations are not the only form of carbon drawdown from the atmosphere. Vast quantities of carbon are naturally stored in rocks. Carbfix imitates and accelerates this process to capture and permanently remove CO2. The technology provides a complete carbon capture and injection solution. To learn about this technology while visiting on power, I met with Olafur Teitur Gudnason, head of communications for Carbfix. Carbfix was started back in 2007 as an international research project to investigate the idea of uh, replicating what nature does uh, with carbon, which is to uh, store it in the ground. Uh, this happens over a long period of time in nature, and actually more than 99% of all carbon on Earth is already stored in rocks underground as minerals. But this happens over a long period of time, so the idea was, can we dissolve CO2 in water and inject it into the ground to make this process happen faster. Uh, and that was started back in 2007. And a few years later, some pilot injections were done here at Hedisheide in Iceland, next to a geothermal power plant where we are situated now. Uh, and a few years after that, uh, some samples were taken out of the ground uh, and it was confirmed that the CO2, which had been injected through water into the ground, had actually mineralized and turned into stone. As we can see from the, these core samples, uh, the first sample is uh, young volcanic uh, basaltic rocks that are in Iceland and in many other places in the world. And they are quite porous, so the water flows quite freely through the rock. And within two years, the CO2 in the water has reacted with the metals in the rock and created uh, a carbonate mineral. And they will stay there for tens of thousands of years. And you will see those as the white specks in the rock sample here on the right. So this is a new way of uh, taking CO2 that has been captured from anywhere, it can be anywhere. In this case, it's captured from the emissions of the geothermal power plant and mix it into water, inject it into the ground, and within two years it has turned into stone where it will be permanently stored. Here we are at one of three injection wells that Carfix uses to inject uh, water with CO2 into the earth, two kilometers down into the uh, 
geothermal reservoir beneath our feet. Uh, so this is our kind of space hut that's becoming a symbol for uh, carbon mineralization underground. And here to my left you can see that we have containers with uh, CO2 that has been transported uh, to Iceland from Switzerland. So it was captured in Switzerland and is being stored uh, as mineral here in Iceland. You can, by different technologies, capture it from the emissions of, let's say, a big industrial plant, like a cement production plant or steel production plant, aluminium and so forth. You can also capture it directly from the atmosphere. And that is a new technology that's also being developed among other things here in uh, Hedlisheide in Iceland. Once you have captured the CO2, the only thing that we do is dissolve it in the water, which creates sparkling water. It is the same kind of sparkling water that you can buy in the store to have a nice cool drink. Uh, the only difference is that we have a, some more CO2 mixed in the water. Uh, and we do not add any other uh, chemicals into the water at all and then we inject it into the ground and chemical reactions happen naturally to uh, turn the CO2 into stone and we have an example actually of this is uh, calcite which is a pure form of mineralized CO2 so this rock used to be CO2 back in the day which has then turned into stone we at Carpfix have been mineralizing CO2 uh, here at the geothermal power plant for 10 years now and we are mineralizing approximately 17,000 tons every year which is uh, not insignificant it's approximately equivalent to removing three to five thousand passenger cars off the streets so that's uh, definitely beneficial but in the global context it's not very big what we are preparing now is a much larger project it's also here in Iceland in a different location and it will be a mineralization hub to receive CO2 not only from Iceland but also from other countries in Europe where we will have a big facility to mineralize much much more than we are doing today or uh, about 3 million tons a year. That's more than all of the industries in Iceland combined. So that is a really big project that we have started designing and will become operational in a few years and reach full capacity in about nine years. Basaltic rock formations is what we need for this process to work and they are found in approximately 5% of the land area on Earth and the majority of the seafloor. So onshore and offshore could both potentially work for us. We also need access to water to dissolve the CO2 in the water. Uh, so that is also something that we need to, for our process. Uh, we are fortunate in Iceland to have lots of water but, and some other places in the world also have that. Uh, but we are also now doing tests using seawater instead of fresh water and those tests are starting in a few weeks here in Iceland. So that will also open up uh, many, many more possibilities for our technology to work. But we are actively looking at several places uh, abroad to introduce our technology. My last visit of the day took me to Vaxa Technologies, also located within the facilities of the Own Power Geothermal Park. We invented, we designed, we built and we are now operating the E2F platform. And we are basically, as a technology company, we're taking an agricultural uh, process into high tech. Vaxa Technologies features a new scientific approach to food production. Through a groundbreaking indoor production process, it converts clean energy into food, producing the most sustainable crop in the world, a microalga rich in omega-3 and proteins. At Vaxa Technologies, I met with Christine Hafleydason, Kitty, who is the CEO for the company. When you have a co-system, you can control all the inputs to your system. Our input is, for instance, water that we need to cultivate. We put air, CO2, salt, nutrients. What we do is we filter and or treat all these inputs so that we control everything that goes into the system. 
This is what, it, what we call biosecure. We can make sure that there are no contaminants and there are no invasive or foreign species that can be introduced into our culture. The E2F platform will be one of the solutions to, f to solve the world hunger problem. Not the solution, one of the solutions. Because in the E2F platform, we can grow biomass for nutrition, for food, and in, we use less than 1% of the water, less than 1% of the land needed for, if we compare to either similar industries or other food uh, products. The E2F platform was created around the conditions here at Hetley Say the Power Plant. And we are fully integrated with the power plant. So we being fully integrated with the power plant, we get CO2 from the power plant, we get environmentally friendly renewable energy, we get hot and cold water for thermal and thermal uh, conditioning and cultivation. So because we are fully integrated with the power plant, our cost of creating biomass or growing biomass is on par with the big industrial or big industrial agricultural systems, but the quality is vastly superior. So we can grow higher quality biomass, which in turn makes higher quality nutrial, uh, nutritional ingredients into food products, but our cost is on par with the agricultural systems. We are the only agricultural, uh, let's say, agricultural system that I know of that is carbon negative. Our process is actually fixing carbon in our biomass. We are fixing more CO2 in our biomass than it takes to make the biomass that we have. So carbon negative, less than 1% of land and water. And on top of that, because the system is closed, there are no herbicides, there are no pesticides, there are no unwanted nutritional runoffs, nothing. So I would say absolutely this is very, very sustainable. Tommy Nutz, it's a real character. Someone that began diving in Iceland in 1973. After establishing Iceland's first paddy dive center, dive.is, in 1998, he spent the following 10 years teaching scuba diving and setting the standards for diving in Iceland. On one of the cleanup dives in the local harbor, he noticed that rubbish was everywhere, not just in the water. So he began organizing cleanups on the shoreline and harbors. Because we cared about what we were seeing on our dive lessons and it just became a big thing and then we uh, moved from the ocean floor to the shorelines and uh, that's how the Blue Army has grown through the years and we have been very very active since 1995. We also visit school children, we visit universities, we go about and do projects with everyone, the president, school children. In my region, we have a specific environmental day where we go and clean our local beaches so that they are clean in the springtime for people to come and enjoy walking there. So. What started with Tommy as a bunch of students from his dive center grew into bigger events with more and more volunteers attending. With the power of those volunteers and his passion for ocean protection, Tommy continues to run the Blue Army, now a registered NGO in Iceland. His cleanups are joined by local and visiting volunteers, politicians and international embassies. The Blue Army is well known in Iceland as well as internationally, and Tommy's dedication to ocean protection doesn't go unnoticed. The World Cleanup Day was founded by 13 NGO leaders that are in the Let's Do It World family, which originates from Tallinn, Estonia. And we are just 
a bunch of people that care about nature all around the world. And we have this World Cleanup Day in September each year. It's like the third Saturday each September. And then we gather together. We get together all around the world and we clean areas that we are found of. And this year there were millions of people participating all around the world. And it, it, it's a global event and it, you know, it's, it's just, it makes everybody so happy. But the key issue is the more participants, the, the, the environmental effect on your mind in participating takes you further into the responsibility of behaving different. You don't throw trash on the streets and you don't, you think otherwise after being a participant in a world cleanup day. Fishing is an intrinsic part of Iceland's history and heritage. Since the country was first settled, Icelandic fishermen have braved the seas to bring home their catch. Fish is an important source of food and laid the foundation of the country's economy. To learn more about fishing in Iceland, I met with Sigrid Merino, the general manager for Iceland Responsible Fisheries. And what a pleasant surprise to learn that she is from Barcelona, the city where I spent most of my teenage years. Iceland Responsible Fisheries is a voluntary certification program developed to preserve the principles of fisheries management adopted by the international community but within the Icelandic fishing industry. It's also meant to document well-managed Icelandic fisheries and last but not least it's uh, meant to give choice and certification for Icelandic fisheries. Iceland is one of the countries that have taken a leading role in managing its fisheries. The Iceland Responsible Fisheries Certification Programme is a third-party certification that verifies Icelandic fisheries to the highest level of assurance. We develop or set the rules that our members have to follow, but it's actually an independent external certification body that carries out the assessments, that gets in contact with the companies that want to, want to join our program and assesses if their proceeding and if their fisheries management is actually according to our standard. With its abundance of mountains, volcanoes, glaciers, rivers, lakes, caves and rough terrain waiting to be tackled, Iceland is truly an outdoors enthusiast paradise. Icelandic nature is fragile and so are Iceland's tiny communities and economy in comparison. With tourism being a fast-growing industry in Iceland, it is crucial to encourage sustainable travel. Integrating sustainability into the travel plans and other actions in life is the key to the global and local welfare of ecosystems, cultures and communities. Islandia and Icelandic mountain guides were a big support to our documentaries, helping us to design a very comprehensive itinerary and arranging the best possible tours and guides. Ivar Fimbogason explained to us the different adventures and activities available and how the company promotes sustainable tourism. So most people go on the south coast and, uh, and sightseeing or enjoying nature is, is by far the number one thing. Uh, popular activities would include anything to do with glaciers, of course, which is our main thing um, and other things that have to do with with Icelandic nature um, horse riding and so on but I think most people just enjoy the the view and the freedom and the relaxed kind of being here to be honest the tourist usually is looking for the cheapest option um, and they are maybe not looking very deep into these matters uh, so even though we have ha have a big heart for the environment and we have been outspoken about these and we've tried to uh, integrate this into our marketing and, and so on. It has not always kind of delivered what we expect in terms of, of basically revenue and, and business. 
And, and this eventually is what needs to change. I mean, people need to you know, make that choice with their wallet and be ready to actually pay for um, you know, environmentally better products and, and more quality. The vast amount of footage and extremely interesting information that we were able to gather during our trips to Iceland made us decide to split this documentary into two parts. I was very lucky to be able to interview so many interesting people and enjoy Iceland's incredible variety of activities, gastronomy, landscape and especially hospitality. This helped me understand much better the country its mentality and especially their concern with protecting the environment.